Few people with an interest in paleontology will have never heard of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, the Victorian sculptures of prehistoric animals unveiled in South East London in 1854. Thanks to being featured in countless books and documentaries, most of us can probably recite the basic details of the Crystal Palace dinosaur story off the top of our heads and will be very familiar with several iconic images and artworks associated with the project. We've all seen this image of the sculptures being built a million times, for instance, and we know the two individuals most closely involved in their conception and construction, Richard Owen and Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. We all know the story of the famous New Year's Eve banquet in the Iguanodon Bold, as well as the fact that many of the models displayed at Crystal Palace dated extremely quickly, in some cases being superseded by superior reconstructions within years of their completion. Because the story of the Crystal Palace Dinosaur Project is so familiar to us, and has been retold again and again for almost 170 years, you could be forgiven for wondering if there's anything original left to say about them. But the thing with stories that get told again and again is that details tend to be lost, embellished or distorted over time, such that much of what becomes common knowledge isn't necessarily a reflection of reality. This is certainly the case with the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Despite being less than two centuries old, there is still a lot we don't know about them and a number of popular mistruths to correct. Since the middle of 2020, I've been working with the Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs charity to develop a new interpretation of these iconic sculptures. We've been both synthesizing recent work on the history and politics surrounding the Crystal Palace project, as well as uh, conducting original research into archive material. The result is an augmented and somewhat modified narrative to the classic history, some of the main conclusions of which we want to share with you here. So one of the first things we want to talk about is how there's a lot more to the Crystal Palace dinosaurs than just prehistoric animals. And to understand this, it helps to know a little bit of context as to why these sculptures were made in the first place. The Crystal Palace project was a grand showcase for Victorian science and engineering. The palace and its ground featured numerous displays and attractions related to newly emerging fields of study, with many devoted to history. But rather than showing artefacts like a conventional museum, the Crystal Palace Company focused on recreating historic places and items that they would have, as they would have appeared hundreds or thousands of years ago. These led to the creation of historic courts that visitors could wander through to see history brought to life before their eyes. They could visit an Egyptian court, an Assyrian palace, and even a Renaissance architecture, among many others. Against this context, the inclusion of a geological court, which celebrated contemporary knowledge of prehistory, was an obvious addition. But the geological court as originally created in 1854 was considerably grander than the Crystal Palace dinosaur site as we know it today. To create a comparable experience to the other historic courts, the geological setting could not simply comprise a few model animals, it had to be more immersive. To achieve this, detailed geological displays were created that essentially told the story of British geology as known at that time. Visitors walking through the site were figuratively, walking, were figuratively walking through deep time from the Devonian to the Quaternary. Much of the court survives today, although its full extent was never realised. Neither the planned number of paleontological sculptures nor the full extent of recreated geology were achieved due to budgetary constraints. The tertiary sculptures and strata were the least complete of region, with both planned geological features and at least another dozen models of extinct animals and birds never being implemented. The geological components of the court were most obviously realised through so-called geological illustrations, real and fabricated rock outcrops that enabled visitors to see geological ph phenomena for themselves. Some were recreated in much the same manner as the paleontological sculptures using building materials, and these included a carboniferous coal seam and limestone outcrop, as well as a mock leg lead mine. Other geological phenomena were created by importing fossiliferous British rocks into the park to be set alongside the recreated species from the same deposits. These rocks are clearly seen alongside the reptiles of the secondary island and include a fossil log which lies behind the Megalosaurus. The geological component of the geological court is all but forgotten in most tellings of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, but it represents an exceptional amount of work and a landmark in scientific education, so, such that it's a, it's a shame we only think of Owen and Hawkins when thinking of this site. We should perhaps also celebrate the contributions of two other figures, the geologist David Thomas Anstead and an engineering geologist we know virtually nothing about, James Campbell. Anstead was a geologist and educator of note and was tasked with designing the layout of the court itself. Campbell's involvement is much more serious, however. It's probable he was the Hawkins equivalent to the geological illustrations, building the mock displays and organising the, imp the importing of fossiliferous rocks into the park. On the subject of personnel, another major change to the narrative of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs concerns the involvement of Richard Owen. 
Now, Owen needs little introduction to anyone familiar with, with Victorian paleontology. He was the leading comparative anatomist of his day and was Britain's preeminent paleontologist for much of the 19th century. Owen's involvement with the Crystal Palace project has, at times, been reported as extensive, with roles including conceptualising the geological court, providing the theoretical framework for its interpretation of fossil life, being a direct consultant and advisor to Waterhouse Hawkins, and providing celebrity endorsement to the project overall. It may seem strange to regard Owen as a celebrity, but in the 1850s, Owen was quite the public figure, especially thanks to his work on the MOA, which he famously restored from a femoral fragment handed to him in the 1830s. Now, we could fill this entire talk about Owen's involvement with the Crystal Palace project, so let's just cut to the chase. Archive material about the construction of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs shows that Owen had minimal involvement with their design and construction. His famous role as guest of honour at the New Year's Eve Iguanodon Banquet is among the only times he visited the workshop during the year and a half construction window, and several documents record the frustration felt by Hawkins and the Crystal Palace Company at their absent consultant. His significance and role to the geological court has been greatly overstated by many subsequent authors. Owen's absence as a consultant had a direct impact on the restorative direction of the paleontological sculptures, and nowhere is this more obvious than with the famous nose horn of the Crystal Palace Iguanodon. Almost, almost mistakenly regarded as following Owenian theory, Owen actually firmly disagreed with the horned Iguanodon hypothesis and presented lengthy arguments in 1855 for why this element was actually a claw bone. He mistakenly thought it pertained to the foot rather than the hand, but this error can be forgiven, uh, can be forgiven given the unusual nature of the fossil and the poorly understood whole of dinosaur anatomy at the time. In reconstructing a guanodon with a nose horn, Hawkins was actually following the work of, an, of other scholars, including Owen's rival Gideon Mantell. There are numer numerous such examples of Owen's apathetic attitude to the Crystal Palace project, not the least being his short, error-filled and incomplete guidebook to the geological court itself. This recasting of Owen as a distant and disinterested consultant to the Pro Crystal Palace project is throwing new light on Hawkins, who we now realise uh, was forced to draw on the opinions and expertise of many other eminent paleontologists to complete his work, of which Cuvier and Mantel were obvious sources. We probably need to credit Hawkins as having much greater intellectual input in the conceptualisation and design of the dinosaurs than previously appreciated. And this brings us to our third major point, Waterhouse Hawkins as an underappreciated paleo art master. We've known more or less for a long time um, how, sorry, we've known more or less for a long time what Hawkins and his team used to build the Crystal Palace sculptures, thanks to both historic documents as well as examination of the models during conservation works. As would be expected for models built in the 1850s, relatively unsophisticated build, building materials were used. The models were supported on metal frameworks anchored into the ground, while iron hooping extended through masonry on their bodies. The brick cores of the models were hollow and covered with various grades of concrete and metal to form body contours, skin and fine anatomical details. But while the construction of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs is generally understood, some uncertainty has persisted about where and how the models were built. We've been analysing a number of overlooked sources of information about Hawkins' workshed, a temporary wooden building located in what was once the wet, windy and muddy park grounds. Hawkins' workshed was visited by a number of journalists and draftsmen who were able to capture in detail aspects of the models being constructed. They also describe and illustrate what seems to be, like, uh, what seems to be a fantasy setting for anyone interested in historic paleo art and go way beyond the information we can gather from the familiar 1853 Illustrated London News image. Now, an inescapable quality shown by these lesser seen images is the packed nature of Hawkins' workshop. Models are stowed into every corner, uh, but there is con some consistency in their arrangement in different illustrations, which we assume reflects artists capturing real views of the workshed and not staged press events. They also show details of how the models were created. Note, for instance, the scale model used for reference next to the life-size standing iguanodon, as well as the workman carving the megatherium directly from limestone blocks. This is, not the only, this is the only model that we know of that was crafted in this way. Other images help us understand the transition of the models from the workshed to the geological court itself. It has not been clear how much construction took place within the workshed and how much took place on site. However, the presence of wooden sleds and wheeled trolleys in several illustrations implies, implies that all but the largest sculptures were crafted in the workshop before being transported to their locations on site for final installation. <laughs> 
For larger models, however, were only constructed from clay within the workshed. Plaster casts of the finished clay versions transported the finely carved features of the concrete. Uh, sorry. Plaster casts of the finished clay versions transplanted their finely carved features to the concrete and brick versions of the same sculptures built in situ on the geological court itself. Perhaps surprisingly, given their vintage, we also have excellent photographs of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs being built. They show construction of not only prehistoric animal sculptures, but also the geological illustrations and provide further details to how these feats were achieved. Note, for instance, the canvas canopies covering the in-progress Haleosaurus and Haleosaurus bills on the lower right photograph, and the partly built chalk cliffs surrounding the large pterosaurs in the left photograph. Of further interest is what seems to be an ichthyosaur model in pieces in the far distance of the right photo. This seems to represent yet another form of sculpture construction and transportation, the significance of which is not yet fully understood. Our photographic records extends to the smaller reptiles and amphibians, including the marine reptiles and labyrinthodon. Of note here are plaster jackets that may have protected the models during transportation, as well as the same sleds that we saw in the workshop illustrations. The haphazard way the models have been placed around the landscape is also startling, especially the Paleotherium model in the bottom left corner of the right photograph, which appears to be resting on its side. The impression we get from these practical considerations is that Hawkins was a resourceful sculptor that brought a variety of skills to the execution of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, but we, we've yet to address their scientific credentials. In other words, how impressed we should we be with their scientific quality relative to other paleo art of the time? To make this a fair comparison, we should first remind ourselves what sort of paleo artwork was being produced in the mid-1800s, examples of which are on the screen here. Early paleo art, especially that involving prehistoric reptiles, tended to favour the dramatic over the scientific, often presenting animals such as dinosaurs and plesiosaurs with a more dragon-like appearance than those of real animals. This was in part because of poor fossil representation, but many restorations bore little resemblance to their reference fossils even when excellent and complete skeletons were known. It's against this backdrop that we have to regard Hawkins' careful and measured approach to the restoration of extinct animals as a major step forward for the portrayal of extinct life. Hawkins was a skilled anatomist and based his reconstructions on his own examination of fossil material, which is perhaps why his reconstructed reconstructions are more sensibly scaled than many previous restorations and also more grounded in anatomical reality. It is no exaggeration to say that while, uh, while many species uh, were ultimately incorrect to the reality of certain fossil animals, Hawkins' restorations look like plausible, uh, plausible animals that could exist under some evolutionary scenarios. We know that Hawkins was carefully re uh, referencing fossil material and actively thinking about the functional morphology and biomechanical problems presented by some of his more unusual subject species. When presented with such problems, he speculated sensible solutions that sometimes mirror what we have since found in real fossil animals. A premier example of this is the shoulder region of Megalosaurus, which Hawkins restored as especially large and humped to imply powerful muscles related to carrying a large heavy head. Although the mechanism Although the mechanisms are somewhat different, Hawkins was correct to predict that certain large skulled dinosaur species would often show adaptations related to head support. Hawkins sculptures are also some of the earliest examples of paleo artworks where we can really see anatomical nuance and consideration. Several of his sculptures show that, uh, that specifics of musculature were factored into their design and have realistically deformed soft tissues related to details of pose and carriage. There is a real sense that Hawkins had conceptualised these animals from the inside out, even when much of their anatomy was unknown. But perhaps the most unexpected qualities in Hawkins' sculptures are captured in his three takes on Anoplotherium commune. This species is depicted in ways that modern artists would regard as progressive and thought-provoking. One statue is seemingly shaking itself dry as it emerges from the water, it once being thought that Anoplotherium was a partially aquatic animal, and two others demonstrate what appear to be sexual dimorphism in overall robustness and facial features. In the past, this dimorphism has been interpreted as the sculptures representing different species, but we are certain this is not the case. Another species of Anoplotherium, correctly known as Ziphodon, was a planned inclusion for the tertiary island, but was never completed, and it's likely this has added to the confusion surrounding the identities of these models. There have actually been a number of misinterpretations of the number of species represented at Crystal Palace, as well as confusion around the number of sculptures in general. We think we have pinned down the correct number for each, this being 23 different species represented by 33 models. This figure was accurate for many decades after the park opened, but in the 20th century, models of Paleotherium magnum and the two small oolite pterosaurs would go missing. 
reducing the number of current sculptures to 30 and the number of represented species to 21. It's at this point we have to address what is unfortunately now the most pressing, pressing issue for the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, their continuous cycle of decay, restoration, and then further decay. Many of us will be familiar with the fact that the Crystal Palace dinosaurs face a number of conservation challenges. Their plight is generally unrecorded in the mainstream press, but significant damage to the Megalosaurus sculpture last May garnered widespread attention and alerted many to the dire situation facing the geological court. It's a sad fact that in addition to inescapable natural wear and tear caused by plant growth, subsidence and extremes of weather, the geological court is also routinely vandalized by visitors to the park. Acts of vandalism include climbing on larger models and even stealing smaller ones, and it is suspected that trespassers must, may have been directly involved in the recent Megalosaurus damage. Unfortunately, the deterioration of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs is not new, and in fact they have required routine conservation since the 1950s. Records of conservation prior to, to those of the 20, uh, sorry records of conservation prior to those of this century are relatively poor, such that much of our investigation into the history of the sculptures involves attempting to distinguish between original and restorative works. We we are increasingly aware that much of what we see is not authentic 1854 craftsmanship, but more recent attempts to patch up badly damaged models, sometimes with little regard for their original appearance. Several such examples of damage are shown here and include the loss of the original large head of Plesiosaurus macrocephalus, the removal of Paleotherium magnum, the loss and subsequent poor replacement of the head of Paleotherium minus, the inexact fiberglass antler replacements installed on Megalosaurus, and the presumed replacement tiny hands for Megatherium. The situation is even worse for the geological illustrations, many of which have been removed or destroyed entirely. The survival of the geological court into the future relies on long-term management and continuous site maintenance, not a cycle of deterioration and restoration. Efforts to this effect are now being provided at both local scale through the Friends of Crystal Palace dinosaurs and more broadly by Historic England. The geological court is now recognised as a grade one listed site and projects related to its conservation are underway, but their future is far from certain due to long-term neglect creating deep-seated conservation issues that will be difficult and expensive to correct. Anyone wishing to help secure the future of the geological court should visit the Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs website where you can learn more about their conservation efforts and future plans, as well as find a page to donate towards site management and conservation projects. The fact that we still have a reasonable approximation of this grand experiment in public science communication and paleo art in South London is not something to be taken for granted, but without our help, the long-term survival of this remarkable place is not certain.